Yesterday I spent four hours helping son Michael and daughter-in-law Rachel and their family move. Uh, we weren't able to help the day before <coughs> because we were at my brother-in-law's funeral. So yesterday I went over there and for four hours helped them move, labored with them, took debris from the yard where they'd cut up bushes and tree limbs and all that stuff. And it reminded me just how much I really don't like moving. <laughs> I wonder how many of you are like us. How many of you have boxes in your storage room, in your attic, in your basement that have not been opened for years? How many of you? Yeah, what is this addiction to stuff? We just keep moving it around wherever we go. And at least when we would move every four or five years, uh, we would purge. You know, that would be our purging time when we would go through boxes, we'd get rid of stuff. And then just before we came here, we had we'd done that purging, and then my mom uh, passed away, and so we got a third of all her stuff. And there they sit in boxes in our basement, and we haven't opened them. We just keep hauling stuff around. Think about Michael and Rachel as they start decorating their, their new home. Can you imagine decorating a home and unpacking all the stuff in pitch darkness? No light, completely dark, and that's how you're going to decorate your home, you're moving your furniture, you're putting pictures up on the wall, all of that you're doing, and it's completely dark. When the lights come on the next day, how do you suppose that's going to look? going to look pretty crazy, right? Here's what I think. I think that a, that a lot of us, and sometimes I wonder, have I, have I given Jesus much more than my entryway in my inner house? And sometimes I wonder, it's sort of like our lives, the interior part of our lives, we've decorated it in the dark. In other words, it's all this clutter, spiritual clutter in our lives, and we've accepted Jesus, and he's in the entryway, but everything else is shut off, and we live our lives, and we sort of do our own thing, and we're decorating in the dark how we live our lives. And today's passage is about learning that Jesus has taken up residence with us, and Jesus wants to start turning lights on in every room of the house so that he can decorate it in a brand new way. Paul says this, for the mind, in fact, read this first part with me, this first slide, let's read it aloud together. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So when you read the mind set on the flesh, another way that that can be, be rendered, other uh, translations say it this way, for the mind controlled or governed by the sinful nature. The mind controlled or governed by the sinful nature is death. But the mind controlled or governed by the Spirit Spirit of God is life and peace. So Jesus comes into our lives and he has a different way of governing, of ruling us from the inside out. The next slide is one of my favorite verses. In fact, it's one that this whole section I quote almost every day in my prayer walk. I love this verse. Then Paul says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies by his Spirit who dwells in you. Notice the word if. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. It's a conditional word. And it's really all through the Bible, the word if. It implies that there's also an if not. If means that there's also other, there are also other possibilities. There are other conditions that happen. Other consequences if we don't do this. So if the Spirit of Him implies that sometimes the Spirit of God does not dwell in people, right? So if the Spirit dwells. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says if you receive these commandments and follow them, then all these blessings will come on you. And he names about 14 verses of blessings that happen in our lives if we heed to the commands of God. 
But then he says, if you don't heed, then all these curses will fall upon you. So that's the other side, if or if not. And then Jesus said in John chapter 8, uh, verses 31 and 32, he said, if you continue in my word. That means it's possible not to continue in his word, right? If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free or make you free. We used to say at the juvenile home, the girls there, that the truth sets you free, but first it makes you miserable. And that's really the way truth oftentimes works in our lives. If you continue in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, that implies that the opposite is true. If we don't continue in his word, then we'll not know the truth, and the truth will not make us free. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, so the same spirit who reached down into the sepulcher, who reached down into the bowels of the earth and pulls Jesus up from the dead, if that spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Interesting verb. The word dwells is a Greek word that is literally houses. Houses. It, 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 we don't use that as a verb in, in, in that general term, but that's literally how it's rendered. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead houses in you. It means takes up residence in you. So imagine Jesus. In fact, haven't you ever had, how many of you ever, uh, you've got guests coming, they call you up, they say we're going to be over in 20 minutes. How many of you have ever tornadoed your house? You know what I'm saying when I say tornado? You know, your wife says they're coming in 20 minutes and let's tornado the house and you go through it and you're throwing stuff in the bedrooms and the closets and you close the doors and your wife says don't let anyone go into the bedroom, okay? Because you tornado the house. You get ready for the company to come and so you try to straighten it all up. Jesus comes into our lives, but a lot of times it's like he's just in the, the front entryway. My, we have a house guest now who's now a resident. Grandma started out, my mother-in-law, Lorraine's mom, started out being a house guest. And then it wasn't long before she just became a permanent part of our home. And, and so we began to make changes based on Marion's presence in our home and in our lives. And one of those changes, when she first started being with us in the guest bedroom, uh, she would come out and sit in my chair. My brown recliner, that became her chair. I'm thinking, well, this, I'm not comfortable with this. And so we had to get Marion a chair, right? So now I have my brown recliner and Marion has her chair and we oftentimes sit together and when I may do lunch, she's got either Andy Griffith or I Love Lucy going most of the time. But we have arranged, rearranged our living room design so that Marion is a part of the family. Jesus comes into our lives and, and sometimes it's like he comes into the entryway. So he's, we're Christians. He's in our house. He's in our lives. But we keep a lot of the other doors closed. In fact, the lights are out. The doors are closed. We're decorating our lives in our own way. And we really don't invite Jesus much farther than the entryway. But he keeps knocking at these doors. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears me and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him. And here's the thing. Back when I was a young traveling evangelist, and when I would blow in, blow up, and blow out, you know, I could say anything and you'd just leave and let the pastor clean it up. Back in those days, we would usually use Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 uh, for sinners, for people who are trying to, get to come to Christ, and you hear him knocking at your door. But as I began to study that passage, I learned that Revelation 3.20 is to Christians. He's talking to Christians. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So you've invited me into your life, you're in, but I'm in the entryway. You've got a whole house filled with rooms where the lights are out and the doors are closed and I'm knocking at the door and I'm saying, let me in here where all this clutter is. I want to come in, turn on the light switch and let's help get this designed and decorated in a way that is fitting the presence of a king. That's what the word dwells means. He, he takes up residence within us. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead houses in you or dwells in you or takes up residence within you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
The same spirit that is sanctifying, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about Jesus turning on the lights and, and redecorating every room in our house. That's called sanctification. That's a fancy theological term that basically means he makes us like an inner sanctuary. He sets us apart for his presence and his glory. That's being sanctified. But now Paul is talking about being glorified. That he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do you know that there's something in us as believers that longs for our heavenly home? It doesn't mean we have a death wish. It doesn't mean that we're ready to get on a bus towards heaven today. But it does mean that everything that we do is tempered with a reality that this is not my permanent home. This is only temporary. And there's something within me. There's a longing. There's a reality that always is sort of drawing me to another place. And that place is to be fully with Christ in His, in His presence. In fact, the next slide gives us Another one of the, my favorite passages, especially when people are preparing to go home to be with Jesus. It says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. I think sometimes we, we, we try to insulate ourselves from that thought process. And we're, we become a culture that we want to constantly stay young or deny aging and the fact is, no matter what kind of shape we're in, eventually, even people who are in an exceptional shape, eventually, the body is going to waste away in some fashion, and they're going to cross over to the next side. So Paul is embracing that. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. So this house that Jesus has taken up residence in, while he decorates it in new ways, we also recognize that slowly it is deteriorating. Now, we know, Paul says, that if the earthly tent, this body, that we live in is destroyed, dies, we have an eternal house in heaven, the realm of God. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. We groan. Inside us, there is this longing to have the glorified body, to be fully made complete in God's presence through Christ. We have a foretaste of it now. We have a, a taste, a seal. The Bible says we're sealed in the Spirit. So we get sort of a down payment of what that's going to be like when we sense God's presence and we're with Jesus. But that's just a down payment. It's just a little taste of what it's going to be. My brother-in-law, uh, last Sunday at 645, Larry went home to be with the Lord. And these flowers are in honor of, of uh, his life. And so on Friday, we had a celebration of life that honored that reality. And it is a reality that Larry knew, even though he was dying with pancreatic cancer, uh, over and over, uh, he told people, I know my Savior, I know where I'm going. And does that mean that if he if the doctors would have somehow been able to extend his life another year or two, he wouldn't have taken it? Of course he would have taken it. He, he left three boys, young boy, and a wife, and he would have taken that. But nonetheless, his, his deteriorating wasn't without hope because he knew where he was going. There is that within us. And how, how do we internalize that reality, the reality of God's realm? How does that become internalized in our lives. The last slide I want to offer you four quick ways that I think we can help in the process. Ultimately, it's God's grace. It's the Holy Spirit doing it. But I think we cooperate in this way with helping this to be internalized because that's when it gets real, right? It's not until something and a truth becomes internalized that it becomes normalized in us. It has to become internalized before it's normalized, before we have a new normal. And so here's here are four ways that I think help that internalizing process of God's reality. Number one is confession. And by confession, I don't simply mean the confession of sin in our lives. I think that's important. I think that we confess to someone, we confess to God, sins in our lives really important, but I don't limit it to that. I'm talking about really confessing who God says we are. 
the life of God is in me, the love of God is in me, the nature of God is in me, the righteousness of Christ is in me, the wisdom of God is in me. That's what the Bible says about us. So part of internalizing that reality is finding the the scripture and claiming that or confessing what the Bible says about you. The second is examination. If you were to go to a doctor and say to the doctor, I'm here for an exam, but I don't want you, I don't want to have to remove any articles of clothing. I don't want to show you my, what's underneath my bandage or my cast. I don't want any x-rays. I don't want any that fancy equipment. You just kind of look me over and tell me how you think I am. Is that an examination? And yet a lot of us, spiritually speaking, that's kind of how we want to be examined, spiritually. Just sort of, well, I don't really want you to probe very deeply but, I mean, I just, I'm okay, you're okay, right? I mean, we're all good in Jesus. That's not examination. Examination is where you probe beneath that. And sometimes tough questions have to be asked. And sometimes we're challenged. And sometimes we have to hold each other in love, but we have to hold each other accountable. Truth spoken in love, Ephesians 4.15. Speaking the truth in love. Truth without love is damaging. Love without truth becomes sentimentalized. You've got to have truth spoken in love. That means the person delivering the truth needs to make sure that God has broken their heart and that when they speak truth to someone in love, it's not in a glib way, it's not in a condemning way, it's not in a way that hasn't factored in some things and with empathy, but speaking the truth in love is a part of the examination. I was privy to a, to a conversation a while back. I was in the same room, I was listening. Uh, it's kind of sort of, I guess, what that means. And, and there was, a, there was a, a parent and child, they were talking, and the, it went something like this, where the, 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 the child had, and this was an older child, but had gone through something of a conflict and didn't handle it real well. And the parent was just offering, at least from my vantage point, was just offering some, well, what if you would do it this way? Or did you think about maybe um, thinking about it this way? And the child got upset. And this, this was a sentence that, that, that got my attention. The child said, I, wanna, I just want to get out of here. I don't want to be where people are judging me. I thought, Whoa, I don't know where that came from. I don't want to be where people are judging me. And I got to thinking about that statement, that our modern connotation, um, you know, there's a definition of a word and then there's a connotation of a word. Our modern connotation of the word judge, is sort of, we sort of are saying, don't challenge me. Don't hold me accountable. The word judge, when Jesus uses it, and we oftentimes quote it, even if we don't know where it is, it's in John chapter 7, verse 1, judge not lest you be judged. In the context, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he's actually talking to a lot of religious leaders. And he's, and he's saying things like in the previous chapter, uh, Go into the closet to pray. Don't go into the busy street corners and let everyone hear you pray. But go into the closet, right? Fast, don't let everyone know you're fasting. Give, don't let everyone know you're giving. So he's talking a lot to not only the rank and file, but really directing a lot to the religious leaders. Well, the religious leaders really condemned anyone who was not a Jew, and the Pharisees condemned anyone who was not a part of their sect. When Jesus says, judge not, lest you be judged, primarily he's talking about condemning people to an eternal sentence. Don't condemn someone. Don't tell them they're going to be separated from God eternally. That's not your job. Judge not, lest that's going to come back to bite you. What he's not talking about, I believe, is that, that somehow we are to suspend our, ability, uh, suspend our ability to discern so that we no longer can tell the difference between a Mother Teresa and an Adolf Hitler. That's just goofy to think that. So when... In modern times now, when we say, don't judge me, a lot of times we're meaning, don't challenge me. Don't hold me accountable to something. And that's not what judgment is talking about at all. It's talking about condemning someone to an eternal sentence. Paul judged people in a discerning way a lot in Scripture, and he called the church to speak the truth in love. So examination has to involve speaking truth in love love. And we've got to have people close enough to us in life that can probe us a little more deeply, like a doctor giving an examination, only spiritually, can really help us 
examine our hearts before God and be honest with the Holy Spirit privately in examining our lives. Thirdly, I think this is internalized by obedience. And we're all pretty flaw-filled with this, right? But we're, we're practicing. And we learn, sometimes real slowly, to when God does show us something, to act on it. That's really all I'm talking about, is practice obeying when God shows us something and try to be open to God showing us those things and obey it. And if we fail, we ask him to forgive us and we, we get up again and we continue to try. But we are endeavoring to learn to obey because obey, obedience to God helps internalize the truths of God and normalizes that reality. And then finally, means of grace. The means of grace is basically anything that becomes this this window or doorway of intersection between heaven and earth. Jesus ultimately is the intersection where heaven and earth come together. But he gives us means of grace, reading the scripture. What you're doing today, worshiping God, hearing teaching, um, having a personal devotional life, all these kinds of things where you pray and commune with God and then the sacraments, baptism. You know, every morning, uh, just about every morning, uh, I begin my day with, I'll take, and I just use a bottle of water, and I just dab a little on my finger and make a cross on my forehead, and I remember my baptism. I, I'm remembering that I'm a, a Christ follower, and I just ask for God's grace to fill me, uh, for the Spirit to renew me, and I just pray that I will honor you today as a child of God. I do that almost every day, just remembering who I am and whose I am. But today when we do communion, maybe look at this as one of those doorways or windows that Jesus provides for us where the physical helps us intersect with the spiritual and comes together as he has taken up residence within us when we take the bread and the, and the cup. It's a physical thing, but his presence, he said, would be here. And so it's a means of grace, this sacrament where heaven and earth intersect in the elements, bread and the cup. In the same day that Jesus would give himself, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it, saying, this is my body given for you. Eat this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of the world. Drink this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me?